Well, hello, everybody. How's it going? Good to see all of you on this hot summer day. We're glad you're here. Um, we're going to continue in our series on Old Testament leaders, and we're going to talk about King Saul. So I actually had a bunch of points and content to talk about King David, but the more I studied him, the more I was like, well, I need to know kind of what happened before him. And so I started looking into King Saul. And then the more I studied King Saul, I was like, I think I'm just going to talk about him. So, so he's a very interesting individual, and I think that we can learn a lot from his example and his leadership. So one of the questions that we need to answer first is why did Israel even need a king in the first place? It's interesting when you think about the Old Testament and about how many different kings are actually mentioned in Scripture, but there had to be a first, right? It had to start somewhere. Israel wasn't always under a monarchy. For the first part of its history, it was under what was called a theocracy. So this is a system of government in which priests ruled in the name of God. So you have the Lord God, he would lead Israel, but he would relay information through a man that he anointed to be his mouthpiece to the people. So he would relay commands, he would prophesy, or he would judge them. And this was the form of leadership from the time of Moses until the election of Saul, who was Israel's first human king. Okay, And I say human king on purpose because they actually already had a king. It was the Lord. So what changed? What caused the people of Israel to want a man to rule over them instead? So if you have your Bible, your phone Bible, we're going to start in 1 Samuel chapter 8. So the current prophet and judge was Samuel, and he had actually led the people faithfully on behalf of the Lord but he was getting older. 1 Samuel 8, verses 1 through 3. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. So we see that Samuel here is getting old, and he's passed on the leadership to his sons, but they're corrupt, and they're not following in the ways of the Lord as Samuel did. Continuing in verse 4, Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old. And your sons do not walk in your ways. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, obey the voice of the people and all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. When I first read this, man, it wrecked me, wrecked me. After all that God had done for Israel, after all that he had brought them through, he freed them, he called them, he provided for them, and he set them apart as his very own people. And they rejected his leadership and wanted something else. Continuing in verse 8, According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So despite all that God had done for his people, the word says that they forsook the Lord and served other gods from the day he rescued them from slavery in Egypt. Seeing and knowing all that the Lord had done for his people, it really is a wonder why they rejected the Lord's leadership and wanted to be ruled by a man. One reason, maybe, is that they were disillusioned by the current state of leadership. 
as we read before, Samuel's sons were corrupt and were not following the ways of the Lord. Actually, before that, Eli, the high priest's two sons, were also corrupt. I don't know if you've read this before. Scripture calls them worthless men who did not know the Lord. Wow. They took advantage of their portion of the meat that was sacrificed to the Lord, and they would even sleep with the women who came to serve at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And we are told that Eli did rebuke his sons, but scripture doesn't say that they were removed from their position or that they repented for their actions. So the people of Israel see that many of the leaders who are supposed to lead them in the ways of the Lord are not. Another reason is that maybe the people thought it would be easier to be led by someone in the flesh, a visible person that they could see and hear. As we talked about before, the Lord would relay information through a prophet and he would speak to the people on his behalf. So the people didn't really have a direct relationship with God like we do today. And they would have to rely on the word and direction of the priest or the prophet. And sometimes they didn't even hear from the Lord. In the days of Eli the priest, 1 Samuel 1, 3, 1, it says, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. So if Israel is disillusioned with corrupt leadership, and they've also not received any direction from the Lord, it's very possible that they saw and envied the success of other kingdoms around them. And they had plenty of kingdoms and enemies to view and learn from. Maybe they thought, if it's working for them, it'll work for us too. Man, a human king is gonna solve all of our problems. They should have known from the experience of corrupt priests that giving a man more rights and more authority over them was not going to solve their problems, right? Honestly, maybe they became impatient and got tired of waiting on the Lord and just decided to do their own thing. We don't know 100% why God's people wanted to move in the direction of a monarchy, uh, but as much as I want to harp on the Israelites for their attitude, we are often just like them. When life gets hard or things aren't going the way that we want them to or we don't hear from the Lord, or he isn't moving as quickly as we would like him to, how easy it is to try and take matters into our own hands and to forget all that he has done for us before. We start looking everywhere outside of God for guidance and purpose and fulfillment. We desire to look like the world, to act like the world, to fit in with the world when we know that we're called to be set apart. And we may not view them as gods or idols, but there are so many things that take precedence over our relationship with the Lord. Even in just the busyness of life, we tend to allow other people and activities to dictate our time and the direction of our lives. 1 Samuel 12, 21 says it this way, do not turn aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver, for they are empty. Let's strive to be different. Let's allow the Lord to bring fulfillment, purpose, and direction to our lives as our one and only king. As much as it grieved God's heart, he gave the people what they wanted. And he had the prophet Samuel warn the people what it was going to be like under a human king and what it would require of them and their families. And if you want to read those requirements, it's found in 1 Samuel 8, 10 through 17. So Samuel did warn the people, but the people insisted. 1 Samuel 8, verses 19, but the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, no, but there shall be a king over us, that we may also be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And when Samuel heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the Lord's ears, and the Lord said to Samuel, obey their voice, and make them a king. So Samuel does indeed find them a king uh, in a man named Saul. The Bible describes him like this in 1 Samuel 9, verses 1 through 2. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, 
the son of Zeror, son of Becherath, son of Aphiah, a Benjaminite, a man of wealth. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. From the outside looking in, Saul was the guy. Tall, good-looking, from a wealthy family. What else could you want in a king? In spite of how well Scripture describes his physical features, Saul has quite a bit of self-doubt that we'll hear about coming up later. So how many of you have ever gone about your day and just been totally surprised where it ended up? Right, like you made plans for your day, but the Lord's like, I have other plans for you. The way that Saul finds out that he is going to be a king is pretty interesting and definitely were not a part of his plans for that day. In 1 Samuel 9, starting in verse 3, Now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. So Kish said to Saul, his son, Take one of the young men with you and arise. Go and look for the donkeys. And he passed through the hill country of Ephraim and passed through the land of Shalisha. It's kind of fun to say Shalisha. But they did not find them. And they passed through the land of Shalim, but they were not there. Then they passed through the land of Benjamin, but did not find them. Verse 5. When they came to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servant who was with him, Come, let us go back, lest my father cease to care about the donkeys and become anxious about us. But he said to him, Behold, there is a man of God in this city, and he is a man who is held in honor. All that he says comes true. So now let us go there. Perhaps he can tell us the way we should go. Verse 10. And Saul said to his servant, Well said, come, let us go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. So we see that Saul is not having any luck in finding his father's donkeys, and they decide to seek Samuel for some help. And as they enter the city, they see Samuel coming toward them. Let's continue in verse 15. Now the day before Saul came, the Lord revealed to Samuel, Tomorrow about this time I will send to you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be the prince over my people. He shall save my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I have seen my people because their cry has come to me. When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord told him, Here is the man of whom I spoke to you. He it is who shall restrain my people. So Saul is out here looking for his father's donkeys, and Samuel is looking for a king. We can see how God was orchestrating the steps of both Saul and Samuel. In Proverbs 16, 9, the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Guys, we can plan our day all we want, but the Lord is going to get us where he wants us. Let's continue in verse 18. Then Saul approached Samuel in the gate and said, Tell me where is the house of the seer? Samuel answered Saul, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for today you shall eat with me. And in the morning I will let you go and will tell you all that is on your mind. As for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, do not set your mind on them, for they've been found. And for whom is all that is desirable in Israel? Is it not for you and for all your father's house? Saul answered, Am I not a Benjaminite from the least of the tribes of Israel? And is not my clan the humblest of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then have you spoken to me in this way? Wild. Can you imagine wanting to ask a prophet about some lost donkeys and the prophet saying that God's going to bless you with the most desirable thing in Israel? Oh, and your donkeys are fine. Don't worry about them. Not that you've even like mentioned them to me. I just know that's crazy. What I love about the Lord is that he can turn a seemingly bad situation into a blessing. Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Saul had a purpose and a calling from God. And the Lord was leading him exactly where he needed to be. Through a mundane situation, the Lord was going to bless Saul and all of Israel. 
Don't miss the Lord in the mundane. Don't miss the Lord in the mundane. He is with us and wants to reveal himself in our day to day. God can use any situation to bring about purpose in our life. So Samuel invites Saul to eat with him and to stay with him overnight. And the next day, Samuel anoints Saul as king. 1 Samuel 10, 1. Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, Has not the Lord anointed you to be prince over his people? And you shall reign over the people of the Lord, and you will save them from the hand of their surrounding enemies. Samuel then gives Saul a list of signs to prove to him that the Lord has anointed him as king. Verse 6, Then the Spirit of the Lord will rush upon you, and you will prophesy with them, and be turned into another man. Now when these signs meet you, do what your hand finds to do, for God is with you. And in verse 9, when he turned his back to leave Samuel, God gave him another heart. And all these signs came to pass that day. For us to fulfill the purposes of God in our life, we have to be transformed. In our flesh, in our own strength, we are incapable of being the people that God has called us to be and to do what he's called us to do. Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Unlike what Israel was wanting to do by becoming like all the other kingdoms around them, we have to choose to be set apart and transformed. We have to become a new person by the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, in 1 Samuel 10, 6, then the Spirit of the Lord will rush upon you and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. I love that it was instantaneous and that it was the Lord who did the transforming work in Saul. And God is always faithful to do his part Philippians 1, 6, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Whatever calling the Lord has placed on our life, we cannot stay who we were before to fulfill it. So Saul is anointed as king, but no one knew it. So he had to be proclaimed as king in front of the people of Israel. So we're going to start in 1 Samuel 10, verse 17. Now Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mizpah, and he said to the people of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, the God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all the kingdoms that were oppressing you. But today you have rejected your God, who saves you from all your calamities and your distresses. And you have said to him, set a king over us. Now, therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. Which is a nice little subtle reminder from the Lord that you guys are not making the right decision. But nonetheless, he gave them what they wanted. Verse 20, then Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel near, and the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. So I've been intrigued by this casting lots. Um, casting lots in the Bible was a valid way to make decisions in ancient Israel. So to us, what seems like total chance, um, this was sometimes how they would make really big decisions, like who the king of Israel was going to be, or if they should go to war or not. In Proverbs 16.33, it says, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Thankfully, we don't have to do this practice today because we have full access to the Lord. He can speak directly to us, but they were under a different covenant than we are. And this was a valid form of getting direction from the Lord. So continuing in verse 21, he brought the tribe of Benjamin near by its clans and the clan of the Matrites was taken by Lot and Saul, the son of Kish, was taken by Lot. But when they sought him, he could not be found. 
So they inquired again of the Lord, is there a man still to come? And the Lord said, behold, he is hidden himself among the baggage. Then they ran and took him from there. And when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. And Samuel said to all the people, do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? There is none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted, long live the king. How many of you have ever tried to hide from your calling? First of all, you really can't because the Lord's going to find you. <laughs> but we sure try sometimes, don't we? No doubt there was a lot of pressure on Saul being the very first king of Israel and leading all the people. I can't imagine that kind of pressure. I felt enough pressure just preparing to speak tonight, okay? Let alone leading a whole kingdom of people. But man, sometimes we can be our own worst critic. We are so good at disqualifying ourselves from anything. I'm not smart enough. I'm not tall enough. I'm not good looking enough. I'm not talented enough. I'm not eloquent enough. Whatever it is. Remember what was said about Saul? That he was taller and more handsome than anybody. Clearly those attributes were absent from his mind at that moment. Our calling is not based on what we say about ourselves. It is based on what God says about us. It is the Lord who calls, equips, and establishes. Saul had been anointed by God as king of Israel and filled with his spirit, but Saul still hid in the baggage. We just talked about how God is always faithful to do his part. Well, we have to be faithful to do ours. Even though the Lord has called you, you still have to choose to walk in it. In that moment, Saul had allowed fear and doubt to cloud his judgment. He listened to his own words instead of the words of the Lord over him. We have to make a daily effort to choose to follow God. One emotional moment with the Lord is not going to sustain a lifetime of obedience. It takes effort. We choose to accept the call by faith, and then we partner with the Holy Spirit to accomplish our purpose. So Saul became the first king of Israel, and the Lord did use him to lead Israel and to protect them from their enemies. 1 Samuel 14, verses 47 through 48. When Saul had taken the kingship over Israel, he fought against all his enemies on every side, against Moab, against the Ammonites, against Edom, against the kings of Zobah, and against the Philistines. Wherever he turned, he routed them. And he did valiantly and struck the Amalekites and delivered Israel out of the hands of those who plundered them. I really wish that I could say that Saul was a king who followed the commandments of the Lord all the days of his life. But unfortunately, that is not the case. This next verse is, is pretty intense coming up, so I encourage you to either flip over there or just really use your, your listening ears. In 1 Samuel 15, verses 1 through 3, And Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people. Now therefore listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel, and opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. I'm not even gonna pretend like that's an easy scripture to read or process. Um, and I know that we all like to view God as kind and gentle and loving, and he is all of those things, but he's also judge. 
one thing that we need to take note of in this verse is understanding that they were not under the new covenant of grace, which is extended to all who believe and enacted by Jesus' blood, okay? They were under the old covenant, which was made with the people of Israel, okay, not the world. Also, people were just way more violent in that time. Everybody was going to war. Everybody was conquering everybody else. You really have to put yourself in that time period and in that mindset. This is one of those scriptures where we just have to trust the Lord's sovereignty, omniscience, and justice. That he was justly enacting punishment on an unrepentant people who had wronged his beloved Israel. And I want to note here this, this devote to destruction. This is not mindless killing, okay? Like, don't think that. What it really means is set apart as an offering to the Lord. So in God's sovereignty and omniscience, he is commanding Saul to utterly destroy the Amalekites and enact justice on them to leave nothing and no one. Let's continue in verse 4. So Saul summoned the people and numbered them in Tel Aim, 200,000 men on foot and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Verse 7. And Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fattened calves and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. Saul did not do as the Lord commanded him to. First of all, Saul didn't destroy everything. Remember that set apart as an offering to the Lord. If we look at the end of verse 9 again, all that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction or offered it to the Lord. So not only did they disobey, but they gave the worst part of the loot to the Lord and kept the best part for themselves. Let's just say that the Lord was not pleased. He hit up Samuel's cell phone real quick, okay? So in verse 10, the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry, and he cried out to the Lord all night. And Samuel rose up early to meet Saul in the morning. And listen to what Saul says in verse 13. Blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Did you? Did you, Saul? Verse 14. And Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen that I hear? Saul said, They... They, the Israelites, have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. Interesting to say my God, that's interesting. And the rest we have devoted to destruction. Then Samuel said to Saul, stop, I will tell you what the Lord said to me this night. And he said to him, speak. Verse 17, and Samuel said, though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. Samuel had to remind Saul of his calling and the word of the Lord over him. God gave Saul a mission and instructed him to obey, and he did not follow through. It seems as though King Saul still had some doubt in his mind about his position. And he gave into the desires of the people over the desires of the Lord. And Saul continues in verse 18. And the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? 
Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, surprisingly, I have obeyed the Lord. I have gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. Here is Samuel's response in verse 22. Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. The Lord does not want your ritual. He wants your obedience. Even under the old covenant, the Lord desired the affection and devotion of his people over ritual and sacrifice. Following God is so much more than just showing up to church on Sundays and Wednesdays. It is every day intentional discipleship, choosing to live for the Lord and not for ourselves. Saul decided to listen to his own voice and the voice of the people instead of the voice of the Lord, to do what was right in his own eyes and not to follow the commandment of God. My question for you is, are you living a life of obedience to yourself or to God? Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Saul had the opportunity to do the right thing and he and his household would have been established as kings of Israel forever. But his disobedience made the way for the appearance of King David who was a man after God's own heart. I encourage you to read through 1 Samuel on your own to get all the nuances and all the details of the life of King Saul and then even King David after him. Some really good stuff in there. But uh, now we're going to move into a time of reflection. If you get your paper notes on the back, there are some reflection questions. Uh, we're going to take about 10 minutes to answer them on our own. And then I'll let you know and we'll have some group table discussion time.